All right. So uh, I just started on a long rant. Uh, there's, we hadn't really gotten started, but, um, you know, I think everybody's in good, good shape. I want you guys to be working on your presentations this week. Uh, and to that end, we've really taken the other tasks away. There's reading from both books. So I want you to get that done. Uh, but none of it is contingent. So you can get the reading done later if, if you want to start working right away. But uh, as I was saying, uh, in, in creating workflow for this week, what I want you to do first off is figure out what you have to say. Figure out your story. And it would be a good idea to write a script. You don't have to write a script. You're not turning it in for a grade or anything. But it helps you. And uh, it especially helps you when you want to record. Because in recording, if you want to get a good audio recording, uh, the best thing to do is to rehearse and rehearse a lot. You become familiar with the words, the phrases, and you get better at it. Uh, it's really easy in an audio recording to tell someone reading something for the first time because there were these awkward pauses where they're reading ahead and sometimes you can even hear them turning pages and things. But when someone is familiar with that text, they don't rely on it as much and therefore they speak much more natural. So um, for you guys, I recommend that you write a script, that you read it out loud before you even try to record it, just being familiar with yourself. And um, then, um, uh, record it as many times as you need to. Uh, we'll talk about recording techniques, etc., as well. But there are a couple of processes through the week. The first process is to figure out what the story is. The second process is to get that story into an audio file. And I want you to start with the audio file. Don't start with the slides. Once you've got a three to four minute piece of audio that tells your story, then you can figure out which uh, presentation program you want to use and go about getting that created. And again, we're going to give you a variety of tools and we'll talk about those tools. That's what I'm going to do this week is just basically be available to talk about different technical processes, different options for getting your audio recorded, different options for applying that audio to presentations. So um, the chapters of Resonate that, that uh, we're having you read have to do pretty much with putting your story together. And so Nancy wants you to take the various elements that you have to, about what you have to say about yourself and your life uh, and put them together in a way that really has an impact. That, and again, you're crafting this entire story based on who you're talking to. You're talking to your dream employer. So there may be parts of your life that are a big deal to you, but maybe don't matter to your employer. You know, uh, that time you got dead drunk in, in Tijuana. It's a big memory. You'll love it. Don't necessarily mention that to your employer. You are crafting this story to tell them why they should hire you. You want to tell them only the good points. You don't want to give them ammunition for telling you uh, that you can't have the job. This is your chance. Don't bring any negatives in this. And a lot of people, when they think about this being like a job interview, they want to take over the interviewer's job and say, why should you be hired? And they even ask themselves that question. Please don't do that. This is your time. You get four minutes uninterrupted. It's a monologue. They're not asking you questions. And don't you introduce any negative thoughts into this. You're not competing against other people. You're not telling them why you're insignificant. You're telling them why you matter. So only be positive and uh, uh, proactive in your presentation. And again, you're crafting it specific for the employer that you want to hire you. So you want to tell them that you know their company. Um, I had you write a lot in the plan about that company. Now, that's not me telling you you need to do a book report on who Pixar is, because if you're talking to Pixar, you don't need to tell them who they are. They absolutely know that. I needed you to know that information so you would feel comfortable talking to them, that you could talk to them about the work that they've done, about how well you fit into that. If you're talking to a game company that you've played their games, then you wanna let them know that you know their culture, you know their humor, that you know their, their ambitions, their artistic values, you, that you fit. And that's the kind of thing that you wanna say directly to the employer. And that's the kind of thing that you could only put in this presentation to the particular employer you're talking to. I, I, would, I would wager that if you wanted to work for Pixar or Blizzard, you would change what you'd have to say 
to fit each one. And therefore, that's the whole point of, pick, of focusing on the audience. You're going to change your narrative to make sure that it's the appropriate one for the audience that you're talking to. And you want to tell them a story. You want to tell them who you are. And it's all this different stuff, but you want to connect it. You want to figure out how to tell that story. And uh, once you've got your words together, then we're going to concentrate on slides because we do want visuals. We do want multimedia. We do want drama here. And we want to show them what we're talking about. Now, you've got to put it in your words, but then finding the right slides, finding the right visuals, and video can count as part of this. But I mean, uh, if, if your video is only talking heads, then you have to actually create slides. So slide content in which you're designing visuals to match the words that you're saying and to have a binary impact, words and visuals together is an important part of this exercise. So uh, if you're gonna be a talking head video, you should count on having at least five or six slides in the course of your presentation. If you're making an all slide presentation, um, then you wanna have enough slides that you're constantly having visual pace. Uh, I know what a lot of students like to do is take six photos, put them together in a collage, and then just hang on that slide forever. That doesn't create any kind of pace. It's kind of boring. And uh, it, it actually is kind of difficult for the audience to pick apart these elements of the collage when you're much better off taking each individual photograph and making it a separate slide, six different slides. And a good rule of thumb for presentations is that you never want to hang on any slide longer than 20 seconds. That just pretty much gets boring if nothing else is changing, if there's not new text coming in or things being added or changed, et cetera. So that means if you're doing a three to four minute presentation, uh, you are going to need at least 10 or 12 slides to have the minimum amount of movement. And uh, you don't want to go crazy with this, but uh, you know, 10 to 15 slides is a really good um, uh, uh, thing to aim for in terms of having enough slides to have enough visual movement that you're not hanging on every uh, um, sentence all the time. So we want to show them. We want to visualize what we're having to say. And uh, to that end, I've actually created a little exercise for us here. Uh, it's called Visualize Ideas. And uh, this is something we can work on together. Uh, if you guys want to, I'm going to put the URL in the uh, discussion board right now. Uh, I have created a, a um, shared Google document. This is a Word doc. And if you click on it, you become attached and you have full editing permissions. So. The thing about Google Docs is that uh, people can work collaboratively. So once you're in, you have full editing permissions. Now this is dangerous, it's something that's risky that I'm doing on my part because any one of you could select all and delete and show the entire page. So when we work together collaboratively on a live document, you have to have some rules. So if you'll notice at the top up here, we have various different uh, little icons that have loaded in. Those are the different people that are on here at the same time. And whatever color your icon is, that's the color that your cursor is. My cursor is black and it matters because anywhere your cursor is, you can start and write over whatever's going, whatever that exists there automatically. So we don't want you to wipe out anything that already exists. What I've done is I've created five words or phrases that might be the kind of typical thing that you put in a resume, kind of, language that almost gets to be cliche. Everybody says it, everybody uses the same term, and it doesn't really have any effect if you read it anymore. But this is a visual document you're creating. You wanna say these things about yourself. These are, these are abstract ideas. How do you illustrate abstract ideas? Well, this is the really important, fun, creative challenge of a creative presentation because you're gonna say these words and they'll be the same words everyone else is saying, but you will combine them with an image that is unique to the image, that is unique to you expressing it. And that combination is gonna create some interest in drama. So this is an exercise in practicing how do you visualize particular phrases or ideas. These are the kinds of things that you might say in a resume. And in a resume, they might be kind of trite and boring. 
But in a presentation, when you combine them with just the right image, they can come alive. They can really be exciting and tell the story. And it's all up to you to find the right image to illustrate the concept. So this is an exercise in doing that, in visualizing ideas. And the, uh, um, the idea is this. I've created uh, uh, five words here, five terms here, that might be the kind of things you would say about yourself. And there are several boxes here. Each one of you wants to choose your own box. You don't want to compete with anybody else. So for every big box, there's a small box that has name in it. What we want to do is call off a box. So this box right here, I, I, did, the, uh, I did the first one. Someone wiped out my name, but I actually had done that one. And so that's adventurous. Uh, I'm going to wipe that out because somebody else can now have that box and, and do their own shape here. But I have called out this box, Team Player. And I'm going to put my cursor here. I have the black cursor here. There's a, there's a light green cursor there already. Someone needs to move that because otherwise, you know, we would compete with each other. But you each want to be in your own space. So the, the way you're going to do it is when you want to have a particular word, you'll claim the big space for your image. And down below it where it says name, you'll write your name first. And you'll tell everybody, hey, I'm using this space. You do, don't, don't, don't mess with it. And there's plenty of spaces here. So we can go down as far as we need. So we're going to go in rows. Everything here is outside the box. So, you know, it doesn't matter how far down you go. We have plenty of space. There's, there's nobody's going to uh, get caught out. And you don't have to do all of them. You might just try to do one of them. But I want you to at least try this exercise. So I've claimed team player, and I put my cursor in the picture box. Now the, the next phase is to do a Google search. This is a Google document. And the cool thing is they have built Google search right into this page. So if I go to insert image, it's right up here at the top, insert image, search the web, suddenly I have a Google search box right in this box, in this page. And so I could put in team player, and that's what you're probably gonna do each time is put the actual word in. And you don't wanna pick the very first thing. Don't be the guy who always picks the first choice in Google's image or whatever, you know. There's, there's lots more to do. But when we have here, we have lots of teams, uh, but they don't really speak to me. And I already have an idea of what I wanted. So you don't necessarily have to search on the word. If you have an idea or an image in your head, you can search on anything. For me, my idea was, I'm gonna put in skydive team. And now I have images of people getting together as they're falling through space and connecting with each other. And I look in, I find, just the right image I want. This one's the one I want right here. And I click on it, it's got a blue check mark on it and the bottom down it says one selected. And when I hit insert, that image gets put into my box. So that's what I'm asking for you guys to do. I'm asking you for to pick a word. Once you've picked the word, stake it out by putting your name in it. And then once you've got your name in uh, on the name spot, Remember to change your cursor because you don't want to put the image down in the lower area. You want to put the image in the image box. And once you've got your image, once you've got your cursor in the larger box, you come up to insert image, search the web. And you can search on the term, you can search on other things, you can do anything you want. But as soon as you find an image that you like and select it, and you hit that select button, it will come into here, into the space here. And uh, so you guys can work on this while I'm talking and we'll come back and take a look at it. And for those of you that are watching this on video, I have linked to this in the discussion board. So you can continue to do this. We can do this all week. So those of you that wanna get some practice just visualizing abstract terms, this is a good thing to do because once you get down to doing your actual presentation, when you tell people that you're a team player or that you think outside the box, you're gonna be able to come up with more interesting imagery. Now there's a couple of factors here. You don't just want to find the image in itself or the image abstractly. I mean, one of the things that makes a lot of PowerPoints boring or, or irrelevant is that they, they work with like the in, initial clip art, like the cartoons that are built in or something like that. Remember, you want to tailor this for a target audience. You're speaking to someone who's a dream employer. You want them to be admiring of your visual sophistication. You want to appeal to them and they possibly have visual sophistication. So you want to not just choose an image. You want to choose the image that's going to be right for the purpose that you have in mind. If you're trying to tell 
some uh, head of a creative company that you think outside the box, you're going to really need an image that 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 says that in true. And uh, if your company is a video game company, then maybe you're looking more towards video game type images. If your company is a, a animation company, then maybe you might use you know uh, stills from animation shows. If your company is um, a design or a, a, an internet firm, then you might use high tech images. But you're, you want to pick an image that doesn't just simply illustrate the term, but speaks to your own sophistication and speaks directly to the audience you're talking about. There's a, there's, there's a couple of things that need to go on here, and that's why we want to do all this in pre-preparation. We don't want to just rush through this. We want to make sure that we're impressing the audience, that we're giving them the right information, and so forth. So I'll let you guys continue working on that and we'll come back and take a look at how people did. And, and again, this is purely voluntary. You don't have to do it. You don't have to do all five. If you just do one, you'll, you'll get the idea. If you want to do all five, I'm really happy to do that and we can, we can take a look. Um, so another thing that we've done this week is that we've made this week's discussion board a zero weight activity, which means it doesn't count towards grade. Nobody has to post in the, in the discussion board this week. So what we've done is we've made the discussion board a kind of um, sounding board for everybody to pass tips along and get feedback on. And this week's discussion board is actually going to be open for two weeks. So uh, you can put in things that you want to get feedback on this week. Like, for instance, if you wrote a script today or tomorrow and before you started speaking it, you wanted to get some feedback, you might post that script in the discussion board and a classmate might give you some feedback or some pointers about it or something like that. Uh, and then later on next week, I'm gonna ask you to post your, your finished presentation so you can get feedback on it from your classmates because next week we're gonna revise these presentations based on feedback that you receive from me and possibly from other students. So the discussion board is open for that. It's a voluntary activity, but I think you're gonna find a lot of really helpful stuff into that. And to that end, I've already pre-populated the discussion board with a couple of videos that I want you to take a look at and uh, some information about how to structure a story. So that's part of what the reading from Resonate is about this week, is that how do you take all those different elements that you, you have in your plan, you know, the things about your beginning, the things about your middle and things about your end, how do you put that together in a, in a story? You know, sometimes, you know, you just want to talk about it chronologically. This happened and that happened and that happened. Uh, but maybe there's other ways to tell the story. Maybe there's thematic ways. Maybe there are uh, dramatic incidences that you, you, you want to focus on and other long-term things that you want to say less of. Part of storytelling is knowing how much of each to, how much attention to give to each part of your story. Abstracting, over some elements and get going into detail on others. If you go into detail on everything, then it becomes just boring. If you abstract over everything uh, and go through quickly th to your story, you aren't really giving people enough information. But a good storyteller will find an incident that is portentous of other things to give us uh, a, a, fl uh, a feeling or a flavor for what's going on. And then we'll take this quickly through other things that Maybe we need to know, but we don't need to know all the details of. So that's the art of storytelling, knowing uh, you know, what to focus in on and what to abstract over and, and how to tell the story so it makes sense. And we know uh, just from last week that there's lots of ways to tell stories. So there are two videos that I posted in the discussion board this week for you that go directly to that and might help some of you. The first one is a TED Talk from a fellow named Simon Sinek, and it's called Start With Why. So a lot of you might be really confused about how to tell your story, and you might be thinking of this as a job interview, and that what you're going to do is sort of recite your resume. Well, we all have resumes, and they're a string of facts. They're those boring PowerPoints that we talked about in the beginning of, of week one. If you just list the elements, First I worked here, and then I worked here, then I got a degree from this and a degree from that. And you list your life as a series of elements, it's boring. But that's the sum of your life. Your life isn't boring. 
just the way that you're telling it is boring. So don't think of what you have to do for this presentation as talking your resume. However, your resume might be absolutely the content of what you have to say. Now, is that a paradox? No, it's not. Because what Simon Sinek does for us is he tells us that the stuff that's on your resume is what you did. It's the facts of your life. You went to this school, you learned this, you were in the army, you worked here, then you did this. Those are facts and we need to know them. But do we just need to know the facts? Simon Sinek's great insight is start with why. Don't tell us what you did, tell us why you did it. What was the intrinsic motivation that led you to do each of these things that are on your resume? Why did you get a job here? Why did you join the army? Why did you decide to study this? That tells us what's going on in your head. That's what tells us what's in your heart. That is absolutely interesting and compels us through the, uh, uh, through the events. So if you want to use your resume as the structure for your story, then turn it on its side and start with why and go through each one of those items in your resume and tell us why you did each of those things. That's gonna be very interesting and that is, I guarantee you, gonna be a story that we wanna hear. And again, with storytelling, some things you've given to great detail, some things you use less detail on. But for a lot of you that are having trouble figuring out how to tell your own story about your own uh, brand, and when we say brand, this is the skills, the person that you wanna be, the, uh, the worker that you're wanting to put up for uh, consideration. Um, Starting with why gets you through all those elements and gets you to telling a story. So that may be helpful to you. I, I suggest all of you watch that video. And even if it's not helpful, I think you'll find that it's an inspiring video and worth watching. The second one is a little bit um, uh, uh, more esoteric. It's called How to Structure a Video Essay. It's by Tony Zhou, and he's, it's, he basically examines a documentary by Orson Welles that hasn't just one subject or two subjects, or even three subjects, but has six different subjects. There's six different things going on in this one film. And instead of doing six different stories and stringing them together, he tells them in parallel. He tells them simultaneously. Talks a little bit about one part, and jumps to another, and jumps to another, and jumps back to the first and so on and so forth. And in doing so, he creates a story structure that is quite interesting. And it's the story structure you're all familiar with from watching big epics. Uh, I, I know most of you watched something like Game of Thrones and it's a vast story that has all kinds of characters in all different locations. And uh, as the story is being told, you jump from one location to another. You're, you're in the mountains, you're in the desert, you're in the, in the, uh, the ice lands, uh, et cetera, and you jump back and back. And eventually the stories all come together, but for the first uh, two thirds of Game of Thrones, there's a, there's a clear 20 or 30 different locations that you're jumping back and forth between. That's a story told in parallel. And that uh, your life isn't really that complicated, but some of you have lives that maybe even you don't understand, that for a time you did one thing and then you decided you wanted another career and something else, and then you realized that uh, you could also use these skills, et cetera. Uh, and instead of trying to tell your story chronologically, it might make sense to talk about different areas of interest that you run in parallel. And therefore, when they come together, that is the crescendo of your story and it makes sense. And uh, Tony Zhou does a very interesting thing in this essay. He explains it all to us in a very simple fashion by comparing it to an episode of the TV show South Park. South Park is an animated show about a bunch of uh, honorary kids in uh, Colorado. And every single episode is 22 minutes long, has three different elements in it that are told in parallel. And at the end of the 22 minutes, the three elements come together. 
I don't know if you've ever noticed that about the story structure, but that's what it does. It does it faithfully. And once you study that structure, you realize that you can use it yourself to tell stories. Now, this won't be relevant to everybody, but for some of you, this might be exactly what you need to figure out how to tell the story. And this is, again, just to say that there are so many ways to tell a story that, you know, I cannot give you a single answer. All I can do is point you in, in various directions. But uh, watch these uh, uh, videos. I think you'll find them helpful. I've also posted uh, a number of articles and links that are helpful. Uh, those of you that are on uh, iPhones and iPads, there's information about how to create audio recordings with uh, iOS devices. Those of you that are on, and on Android um, devices, uh, I have some articles about how to record audio for Android. Uh, I have a listing of various different online production um, tools that, you, that are available. There's a whole bunch of them. There's uh, uh, a lot. We're gonna talk about some of them uh, uh, a little later. But uh, I can't cover them all. But uh, if, if, if any of you have recommendations for a particular online presentation tool, if you've used Prezi and you love it, uh, I'm not a particular fan of Prezi. So, uh, you know, those of you that are wanting to please me, uh, you know, just hear my words. I, I don't love Prezi. Uh, I recognize that other people love it, so I'm not going to say you can't use it. But uh, there are lots of other really great tools. There's emails and and, uh, and so forth, and we'll talk about tools. But uh, uh, those of you that have a particular tool you would like to recommend, uh, the discussion board is a great place for you to pass along your tips for other people. And we're also gonna talk about uh, tips for recording audio, et cetera. Um, the last thing in the reading that I wanna talk about is uh, something that, that's covered uh, that talks about how you present yourself to your audience. Uh, people have been standing up in front of audiences and, and, and speaking to them for ages. And uh, this is something that the ancient Greeks particularly loved to do. So 3,000 years ago, Aristotle looked at this situation and he wrote a, a little uh, theory called the Three Pillars of Public Speaking in which he theorized that whatever it is you have to say, your relationship to the audience is one of three things. So the three pillars that he puts forth is that one way that the audience can uh, accept you is that they believe what you have to say, that you put yourself forward through ethos, the appeal to trust or credibility, that you stand up and you say, I'm speaking to you honestly, I want you to believe me. And there are several reasons that people might trust you. One might be that you have used hail in your delivery and you're giving them uh, audio orally a, um, an authentic, uh, voice. Another might be that you just sort of have an honest face. Maybe you look like Tom Hanks and people tend to trust you. Another might be that you have a fancy uh, resume. So if you're a doctor or you have a PhD, people might believe your credentials. But the appeal to trust has to do with whether the audience wants to believe you in and of the moment. And it doesn't necessarily always mean your credentials are important. You could be someone who wants to talk about cancer and you've never study medicine or anything, but your mother died of cancer and you lived through that and your lived experience gives you credibility. So you can stand up there and speak on your credibility if you're coming across as that kind of narrator. The audience believes you because you're trustworthy. Another way to appeal, if, if they're not necessarily convinced of who you are or what you have to say, you can appeal to their emotions. Pathos is the appeal to emotions. Now, if you're a young, uh, recent graduate, full of energy and fire, but not a lot of experience, and you wanna get hired by someone who's been around in the industry for 30 or 40 years, uh, you, you not necessarily get them to trust you, but you can certainly show them how enthusiastic you are. You could pump them full of emotion, to get them to rec recognize an, uh, 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 themselves in a younger year or something like that. So. Uh, oftentimes, if you're in a position where you do not have an authoritative bent to what you're saying, the way that you can persuade your audience is through emotion. Now, this is uh, always um, powerful, but it sometimes gets out of control because there are lots of emotions. And so it's not always happy emotions. We'll talk about that in a second. But 
the appeal to emotion has a real strong bent to it, but it also is something that you need to be um, in control of or it can get away from you. A third way that people can believe you is that your argument has uh, logic to it, that you have put together an, uh, an impeccable story and backed up all your facts and the audience keeps looking for flaws in, in your theory and they can't find any. So let's look at these a little bit uh, more in detail. If you're appealing to people because of ethos, then the audience is asking, does the, you know, we're asking, does the audience respect you? Does the audience believe you're of good character? Does the audience believe that you're trustworthy? Can we just believe what you say because you say it? We're living in times where nobody believes anybody anymore. People are talking about fake news. And this becomes a really hard thing to do is to trust people. Does the audience believe you're an authority on this topic? And so it really has to do with the way you talk, the bearing that you put forward, uh, and, and the way that you present yourself. Um, you know, people can, um, can have huge credentials but sound kind of fishy. You're, you're, you're still not going to trust that person. Uh, we've been we've been led to be so wary of people. So you want to be authentic. You want to come across. You don't want to sound like you're talking down to people or you disrespect them. You really need to have your hail in place if you want to be uh, believed upon your ethos. Pathos. Do your words evoke feelings of love, sympathy, fear? Now, in the position, in the assignment that I've given you, you really only want the audience to like you. So if you're gonna use pathos, you're gonna to try to put happy memories in their, uh, uh, their hearts. You're gonna to wanna to make them feel good about you. But the appeal to pathos goes both ways. You can, you can um, make people angry and, and, and uh, fearful as well. You know, do your, your visuals evoke feelings of compassion or envy? Your characterization of the competition evoke feelings of hate and contempt. Uh, we're about to come into the political season and pretty much every political ad you ever see doesn't really build up the person who makes the ad. They tear down the person they're running against. They use emotion, but they use it in a negative way. Now, this is nothing that you're gonna encounter in this particular presentation, but certainly if you get into advertising or you do other things where you're competing against others, you can use pathos as a way of putting negatives out towards the other side. Doesn't make you any better, but it probably makes you better in comparison. Uh, but a, a negative advertising or using uh, negative emotions for this kind of persuasion is something that you need to be very in control of because when it backfires upon you, then you've actually uh, lost your credibility and you've lost your logic. So uh, this is a very, um, uh, it's like playing with dynamite. You've got to know what you're doing. But uh, it, it, it's very effective and that's why advertising uses pathos an awful lot. Now in logic, does your message make sense? Is your message based on facts, statistics, and evidence? So people are gonna to try to poke a hole in your argument. So when you say a fact, you might footnote where it came from, or you might tell us who that said that quote. Or if you show uh, a chart, you might wanna give us all the, you know, the background statistics on it. So every time you put forth something that someone might fact check, maybe you wanna even like put the fact checking in there. You don't necessarily put it up front, but you make sure that it's on the slide so that people cannot fault your logic or your argument. Would your call to action lead to the outcome that pr you promised? This is almost like the summation argument in a legal case. You're gonna go through all the elements and you're gonna say why you proved them and you're gonna say why that the outcome that you're asking of your audience is exactly called for based on your impeccable logic. Based on everything I've told you, you should hire me. Based on everything I've told you, you should buy this product. Based on everything I've told you, you should join this cause. Whatever your call to action is going to be, it could be led specifically to by the elements that you're talking about. So you may be incorporating some emotion. Uh, you may be asking to be trustworthy, but you're really counting on their doubt because you want to overcome their doubt with your logic. And a logic-based argument usually 
uh, tends towards dispassionate things. If, if you want to get a job as a programmer, a logic-based argument is probably going to be more uh, convincing than an emotion-based argument and so forth. So these overlap. None of these is uh, you know, in isolation or opposition to each other. Uh, you know, an ethos-based argument can overlap with a, a pathos-based argument and so on and so forth. Now, if they all overlap, certainly you've won the audience, but that really doesn't happen. Usually what you get is an overlap of one of the two, but rarely all three together. But uh, this is a theory in it about relationships to the audience. And you can think about who you are and, and, and who the audience is, and you can actually figure out and define that audience. And then you can use these elements as a way of crafting your story. And uh, as always, knowing these things helps you put together a better argument. So um, that's enough of that. I want to come back here and talk about the assignments for this week. So there's not a lot. Uh, you get the reading done. You get the reading done. Uh, simultaneous with working on the project. It's not required to get the reading done before you work on the project. So I would get started on the project today. I went, that's why I made sure I graded all the presentations and got them back to you. Uh, I'll, I'll be getting you feedback on your emotional stories tomorrow. All of you did really great, but I mean, I want to I give you some individual pointers and, 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 and stuff. But I know that you guys have the ability to, to voice these presentations and do a really good job with it. And uh, most of you really have already shown that you can combine them with multimedia and add power to your presentations that way. But I want you to be working on your presentations throughout the week. Um, getting them in early is good, but it won't necessarily uh, make them any better. I want you to use all the time you have so that you really are working through the week and you go through this process formally. Get, figure out your story, write it down if you can voice it, record it, get the recording done before you're ready to go in and start working on the slides. And so uh, this week's assignment, and uh, again, there's a helpful video in here about you know storytelling again to get you going. And I want you to just look at the short instructions just to remind you, you know, the assignment is three to four minutes long. It needs to be a finished presentation. Um, it can be in edit form still. So uh, meaning that it, you, you, you can have to click to, to engage things or if there's a placeholder for something, it's all right. But I really want to finish presentation. And some of you are going to have trouble combining your audio and your slides. Uh, and if you can't get that done by the end of the week, uh, I will accept that you turn in your audio and slides separately and we will work on combining them next week. So don't let that be uh, uh, something that it keeps you from going forward. If you get your audio done and then you start working on the slides and you have trouble integrating the audio and the slides, get a hold of me. I can help you through all that. I want to talk you through it uh, just now. I'm going to show you some stuff in a second. Uh, and then figure out the production tool you want. Uh, I would actually hope most of you start working on the audio recording before you necessarily finalize on the uh, presentation tool. But Keynote, that's what I'm using right now, um, is the audio, is the Apple version of PowerPoint. PowerPoint, you all have uh, as part of the suite that you downloaded. So you all have the latest, greatest version of PowerPoint. I highly recommend PowerPoint, uh, except that if you've never used PowerPoint before, there are so many options that it's confusing. So I don't wanna dissuade you from using PowerPoint, but if you have never used PowerPoint before, I think that its complexity will be a hindrance to you. And that's why I would recommend Adobe Spark. Uh, Google Slides is very much- Adobe like Spark is really good. Is there a question? No, I was saying Adobe Spark is really good. Okay, yeah. Uh, so there you go, you have some uh, uh, reinforcement. I highly recommend Adobe Spark. It's easy to use and gives you really good results have great uh, uh, artwork that, the, that you can have access to and so forth. But you can really use any online presentation tool. Um, Google Slides is very much like PowerPoint with fewer options. So it's a great way to start figuring out PowerPoint. The problem with Google Slides is, and with a whole lot of these online tools is that they don't include audio tools by themselves. You can add audio to them, but you can't use, 
can't do the audio by itself. So in that regard, uh, we want to uh, talk about what can we use to do the audio. And um, like I said, I put uh, some, some uh, suggestions here in the discussion board for uh, what you could do. Uh, and so this last link here, uh, the very last link is the visualizing ideas. I'm going to get back to in a second. But I also put in here some uh, links to uh, audio for uh, Apple and, and, and uh, Android. I put in some links to some uh, online tools. If you're using an Android device and it's an older Android device, you're going to find that there are a lot of multimedia tools that don't support it. And VoiceThread is one that does. So we have found that if you have an older Android device and you're having trouble running PowerPoint or, or using Adobe Spark or a lot of other things, that VoiceThread is actually a very simple presentation tool that you can use. It records audio, it takes slides, it will do what we're asking for. So it's not the greatest presentation tool in the world, but it is something that if you have an older piece of machinery and you're having technical issues, you'll find useful. Our number one go-to we're gonna recommend is Adobe Spark or PowerPoint. Uh, and then there's an article here with 31 or 40 uh, different, uh, uh, yeah, it's up to 40 at this point, different tools. So you might look here uh, to find uh, possibilities, but be aware that most online tools don't include audio. Uh, Adobe Spark does, so you can do your audio directly into Adobe Spark. Uh, the only issue with Adobe Spark is you have to sign in and get an account with them, but just use your school credentials. The account is free and they will allow you to export the file out. So, so far we've been very, very pleased with um, uh, Adobe Spark. A lot of the online presentation tools are a kind of uh, upsell where they'll, they'll set you up immediately, but if you wanna get your, <clears throat> your program out or you wanna be able to access it in other ways or, or stuff, they'll ask you for a fee. So we don't want you spending any money on online tools. <clears throat> and then finally, uh, I have the link here for those of you that are uh, on video uh, to Visualizing Ideas Project. And uh, uh, let's see how some people did. Uh, Dominic uh, has a, a walk in the woods for adventurous. That's very good looking. Uh, or uh, Eric has looking over a precipice. That sounds pretty adventurous. Um, we have Eric, uh, Christopher showing us... Uh, um, you said that we could use our uh, school stuff for the Adobe Spark. Um, this is uh, the visualizing ideas exercise, but Adobe Spark, if I uh, come back to it here, uh, has an online uh, section. So you need to you need to sign in and create an account. And there are three types of Adobe Spark graphics. So make sure social graphic is a, an image. A web page is a web page. You want to do a short video. These are all presentations. And if you create a video, they have tools that, that offer you search art that you can use. You can bring your own art in. They allow you to record audio. A lot of you like to have background audio. Uh, Adobe Spark supports background audio and so forth. Uh, and, and even some of the uh, online graphics uh, are uh, motion video. So. Uh, there's there's a lot you can do with this, and it's fairly simple to use. But it's an it's on its own website. You have to go to Adobe Spark and create an account to use it. And again, those of you who are on your own computers, I've uh, mentioned that you can do your audio on yourself. Yourself, uh, there is an audio tool called Audacity that we highly recommend. Whether you're on a Mac or a PC, this is free open source software. And it's, it's the, pretty much the same on either uh, platform. But as you see, it gives you a visual representation of your recording. And that helps you uh, in a lot of ways. You can see that you're, whether or not you're getting a clean recording, because if this waveform is very thin, then you're not recording it well enough. If the waveform runs off the page, you're over recording or you, your microphone is too hot, meaning you've got the microphone too close to your face. So, uh, <clears throat> There's not, a, we don't want to go too much in depth on audio here, but the stuff everybody needs to know. One is that 
uh, if I'm asking you to use your phone, or even if I'm asking you to use your laptop, you want to make sure your, your mouth is the right distance from the microphone. Uh, with, with a phone, it's usually too close. With a laptop, it's usually too far away. Uh, you start with figuring out where the microphone is. Now, it's easy on a phone. You know that the microphone is at the bottom of the front face of, of the phone that you're holding. And it's meant for you to hold that phone right up to your face and for you to talk in your phone voice, which is kind of a whisper. But I want to hear your speak out loud voice. So if you're going to record with your phone, I want you to hold that phone four or five inches from your mouth and therefore speak with more power in your mouth. The more, the louder, the more power in your mouth, the further away the microphone needs to be to not be blown out. And holding it four or five inches away is enough to get a good clean recording that you can speak in a normal voice. Now conversely, on a, on a laptop, the microphone is usually going to be at the back end of the keyboard, right at the bottom of the hinge where the screen is. So as you're seated at a desk, you might be 30 or, or uh, 35 inches away from that microphone. And that's not going to give you a great recording. So if you're using the microphone on your laptop, figure out where it is and kind of lean into it. And if you have an external microphone for your laptop, if, if maybe you have a gamer headset uh, and the microphone is uh, uh, sort of built off the earpiece and naturally three or four inches from your mouth, then you're probably all set. You're probably gonna get a decent recording. But uh, the, the, the volume of the recording is important. You don't want to overdo it or underdo it, and being able to see the waveform visually tells you in an instant how well that's going. And another great thing about Audacity is that if you want to do any kind of editing, it's really just point and click. You can select little mistakes that you want to uh, get rid of. Uh, you can select them, highlight them, and delete them. So you can actually edit your recording. Uh, things like PowerPoint, which will record the audio but won't give you any kind of audio editing tools. You've got to make sure you kind of get it right the first time. So I highly recommend Audacity. It's free to download, uh, and uh, there are a lot of easy tutorials to learn from as well. So um, the last thing I want to mention is a, uh, a little um, gotcha that's built into PowerPoint. I want to open up PowerPoint here right now. So let's look at PowerPoint. Let's start a new PowerPoint. I'm going to... Uh, Pick a, um, pick a template and create it. And so here it is. It's asking me, you know, what is my title slide? So I'll just go ahead and name it. I'll call it my brand. And, uh, you know, put my name on it. So there's my, here's my title slide. And it's also slide one. That's very important. Now, uh, to, to do what I'm talking about here, I'm gonna go ahead and add a few more slides. Let's add a slide two, and uh, you know, I'll be really uh, clever and name it slide two. Uh, add another one, I'll name that one slide three, and one more, uh, just to have a few slides because I wanna show you how this works. So, to record audio, I mean, a lot of you uh, have always thought that to record audio on PowerPoint, you have to record so much per slide. You put the audio on slide one that you want, and then you put the audio on slide two that you want, and you go on and go on. Well, that's not the way we want you to do it, and that's not the proper way. I want you to do this as a continuous audio recording. It's much more natural that way. It's harder to get the recording, but you know, I want one three to four minute audio recording of you saying everything you have to say from beginning to end. And when you're gonna put that in PowerPoint, you need to put that on slide one. When you're gonna insert audio into PowerPoint, you need to insert it into slide one. So when you're on slide one, you can go to the insert menu. There's an insert menu here. Uh, there's also an insert menu at the top. So you go to insert audio and you can get external audio loaded from here, but there's a, a feature to record audio. So when I turn that on, I have a little box. Let's try that again. All right. So here's my this is my video recorder, 
And it's very simple. When I hit red, it's going to start recording. When I hit stop, it'll stop. And then when I hit insert, it'll, it'll put it on the page. So I'm going to start recording now. And PowerPoint is recording everything that I have to say. So if, I, if this were my presentation, I would speak it from beginning to end. I would, have, I would be reading off a script. I would have rehearsed that script ahead of time. And now I'm saying everything that I want to say all the way to the end. I'm hoping I don't make any mistakes because if I make a mistake, I might have to start over. But it's not that big deal to start over. You can get all the way through, especially with more rehearsal. So I'm stopping. I've got 24 minutes of, of audio here. And I hit insert. And now I have an icon on my desktop, this audio icon. Now, this is important because there is so much stuff in PowerPoint that they hide stuff from you. Uh, I think it's very bad design, but you know, apparently Microsoft is uh, you just stuck the gills and they figured this is what they had to do. So there are eight menus here right now. Home, insert, draw, design, transition, animation, slideshow, review, uh, view and tell me actually more than eight. But there are menus that only come up in context meaning that you will never ever see these menus unless you actually have engaged the right thing. So there are some audio menus that you need to have access to and you'll never know they're there until you create audio and select it. And when you do select it, suddenly there's an audio format and a playback menu available. So you need to create the audio and select it before this menu is available. But once it is, you can come back to the playback menu and there's two important things I want you to do. I want you to start the audio automatically so people don't have to click to engage it. This is multimedia that runs itself. And very importantly, I want you to click play across slides. Unless, until, you click, until you click this button, the audio on slide one that will never ever appear on any other slides. And you know, uh, it's somewhere in the PowerPoint presentation uh, documentation, but really, Software doesn't come with manuals anymore, so it's very hard to know. This is a hidden command and it, it infuriates me because it's something that you guys really, really, really need to know. So that's why I'm showing you now. So when you create your audio, select audio, go to the playback menu and make sure you click play across slides. Now once you've done this, PowerPoint is incredibly powerful and incredibly easy to use. If I want my audio to get evenly distributed amongst these slides, all I need to do now is come up to menu that says slideshow and hit a, a tool called record slideshow. Now, when I do this, PowerPoint's going to go into playback mode. It's going to start playing slide one and it's going to start playing the audio automatically. And it will continue to stay on slide one and play the audio until I click to advance the slides. So now I can listen to the audio. And I can choose when I want slide two to start and when I want slide two, three to start, et cetera. And PowerPoint is gonna record that and remember it. So let me do that for you now. I hit record slideshow. So I'm gonna start recording now. This is the audio recording. PowerPoint is recording everything that I have to say. So and now I'm gonna go forward. My presentation. I'm on slide I two. I would have, I'm competing with myself, aren't I? Script. I would have rehearsed that Now I'm gonna go to time. slide three. Now I'm saying everything that I wanna say all the way to the end. Also and here's slide four. Mistakes because if I make a mistake, I might have to start over. But it's not that big deal to start over. You can get all the way through, especially with more rehearsal. Now I'm done. It asks, do I want to record this, remember this? And I say yes. So PowerPoint has now taken all of my 24 seconds of audio and they put six seconds of it on slide one, six seconds on slide two, five seconds on slide three, and nine seconds on slide four. It'll remember that. And now it will play back this way for everybody. And if I change the order of my slides, or I add a new slide, or edit it in any way, I can just rerun this and redo the audio, and I can do it as many times as I need to get the sync exactly the way I want it. So PowerPoint is very in, in, uh, powerful in the way that it allows you to very specifically set up this relationship. But you can't get anywhere until you get the audio in place and you click play across slides. So remember that hidden trick, that's the gotcha that I wanted to make sure everybody knew about. So I'll let that go. Those of you that want to use PowerPoint, just remember how to get your audio in properly. And you can also do your audio in Audacity, create it as an MP3 file or a WAV file and import it. And that will work as well. So 
there are a lot of options there that you can use. Uh, so now let's take some questions. I'm sure I've gotten through a lot of stuff that's confused people, but uh, let's see how everybody's doing. Anybody got any questions for me? So Steven says he's used Audacity and it's good and he's got the Adobe Creative Cloud suite. Yeah, if you're working at higher end tools, please feel free to use that. I just know that this is a month one class, so I don't want anybody to take on a really difficult piece of software and feel like you've got to learn that in order to do this. We've all discovered that there are ways to get multimedia made and I'm gonna make sure that everybody has a tool to make that they can they can run themselves without having to, to do a whole field of study before you can use it. So I want everyone to work as advanced as they can. If you already know something, take advantage of it. But if you have never used the multimedia tools, we want you to use the ones that are easier to use. And to that regard, that's why I'm recommending Adobe Spark to so many people. A lot of people who've never done presentations before can do really sophisticated work very quickly. Do I have an example of a presentation? Yes, if you look for announcements this week, I think I'm gonna post a list of some presentations that you guys can go through. Previous students, uh, I've, I've been loath to give people examples, but uh, I, I understand now that, that people kinda of wanna know where to go. And if I give you enough examples, there won't be one style that everybody does. So um, look for, probably not today, but tomorrow in announcements, uh, a list of uh, previous student projects that you can look at. Uh, anybody else? Anybody want the microphone? You just raise your hand, I'll open, undo your mic. Uh, anybody just want to type a question? When you say a page double spaced is about one minute of speaking, what is the font size on that? Uh, I wrote two pages of text for the story and it ended up being over uh, 10 minutes. Um, well, It's, it's hard because uh, computers are, are so variable nowadays, but uh, we typically mean the kind of thing you would get from a typewriter. So uh, you, you're talking about 12 point font, you're talking about uh, uh, double spaced, uh, being probably more than double spaced in computer language, et cetera. Uh, Dominic says 12 point new Roman, one and a half spaced one page equals one minute. Well, that's as clear as I can get it. Uh, so yeah, if you're using a smaller font, if you're crowding those, those double spacings, you can do anything you want with a computer. But uh, in general, what we, I'm, I'm old school. So when we say what something looks like on a, on a, a written page, we tend to mean what, you, what it came out of as a typewriter. And when a typewriter double spaces, uh, it's usually more than a one and a half inch, one and a half space. So you just make sure you, you've got a wide enough margin there, or you can just go with word counts. You know, that also, also works as well. Any tips on how to not trip over your words when recording? Uh, no, uh, I, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get Audacity to come up for me right away right now. Uh, I had to redo my computer because of last week, but uh, let's see if I'm lucky here, and I want to show you some interesting tips. Uh, am I recording? No, I'm not recording. So, uh, uh, terrible. All right. If I were recording, I, were, I would be getting uh, uh, an audio uh, waveform here, and you can see the waveform. And the thing about a waveform is that it, you can tell things without knowing without hearing it. Meaning that if you see a bunch of squiggly lines and then you see nothing, then that's somebody not talking. That's the space in between a phrase. So a really cool thing about Audacity is that you can start recording and if you mess up, keep recording and you can create a pattern for yourself. So let's say I'm reading from a script and I mess up a word. All I have to do is not talk for two seconds. And then I'm going to put a space on my waveform that I can immediately identify. And then I start talking again from the correction. So when I come back and I've done the entire recording, I've done more than four minutes of recording. I've done several minutes because maybe I made a couple of mistakes and started over a couple of times. But if I go back and I look for those long pauses, 
All I have to do is go in there and select them and hit the delete key. And you know, that is something that happens there. You, you can delete audio from the file as easily as selecting it and hitting delete. And so if you have us or, or, or hymns and haws, things that you want, little pops uh, that you want to get out of recording, it's very easy to do that. Uh, and if you create a, a pattern instead of having to get everything perfect, but that as you keep reading and you're happy with stuff, you keep going. And when you make a mistake, you just pause so you can find that mistake and start over. Then you can come back and you can do, you can edit this thing very quickly and have a very clean recording uh, in, a, in a hurry. That's another thing that I really like. And then uh, another great thing about Audacity is that it exports audio uh, in a lot of different formats. So you have a lot of choices with that. So uh, make sure your microphone is set in the right place. Getting it too close or too far is uh, an issue. And uh, make sure that uh, I'm not a stickler on you know cutting out all the bad spots on your audio. Uh, rehearsal really helps a whole lot. Uh, and, and then it's easy to make a recording, so you, you know to re-record is fine. But if you really want to, you know, get in there and and uh, you know be spot on, uh, an, uh, a program like Audacity that allows you to go in and just blip a mistake away uh, is perfect. But uh, remember that in speaking naturally, like uh, yeah, this, uh, I know it's not going to work, but uh, when you have that spacing here, when let's say there was a, 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 a there was a waveform here and there was a waveform here and you wanted to get rid of the space, don't select the entire blank space because what you're gonna do is you're gonna have the end of one word step right on the beginning of another. And if, if it were natural to have a pause between one sentence and another, then you wanna have a little bit of extra space. So instead of, getting rid of the entire blank space, you get rid of most of the blank space, but you'd leave a little bit of space there so that there would be a pause between the sentences and it would sound more natural. S having words cut right on top of each other sounds unnatural. It only takes uh, a little bit of working with audio to, to kind of pick that up, but it, you, you just understand from the ear easily how, how uh, well it works. And uh, Audacity isn't the only program that, that does this, but it's it's a free program and a lot of stuff in the audio costs money. So we just, unless you're going to be an audio professional, I want you to use free tools for this extra multimedia. Uh, so do I have any more questions? So I want you to have fun this week. Uh, you know, this class isn't successful unless you guys enjoy it. It isn't successful unless you're fun, having fun. You guys are creative artists. I've given you a really good, interesting, juicy problem. How are you going to sell yourself and your skills to your future employer? And I want you to take that idea seriously, and then I want you to make a really compelling argument. And, uh, uh, you know, sometimes I have trouble talking people into the assignment. They say, well, this is silly. You know, well, it's not silly. If you can successfully visualize the person you want to become, you will have created a roadmap for yourself for the rest of your college career about the person you want to become. So that's what I want you to do here. I want you to think about who that person is and I want you to sell that person to the place where he or she deserves to work. And I want you to do it in a compelling piece of, of creative presentation. And if you've accomplished that, then you've got a marker for the rest of your college career about, you know, what skills you want to gain and how you want to become a creative employee that everybody values and admires. And that's what this is all about. So that's a fun challenge. And these are great tools that I have for you to use. You're giving you free range, use video, don't use video, uh, record audio separately, record audio in the program, whatever works for you. I need a three to four minute presentation with audio and accompanying visuals and slides. And uh, any way you get there is fine by me. I'm gonna help all of you all week. Uh, so figure out your path. And if you have any uh, dings in that path, let me know and I'll, I'll clear the road for you. Everybody cool? Everybody gonna have fun this week? Wanna hear yeah?
Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. Have fun. That's my command. Go forth and be creative.